Hello everybody and welcome to another edition of tier ranking the various national representatives from each state and trying to see what kind of an influence they have on policy, discussing their uh, politics, where they get their money, how they operate, getting to know the states a little better, and also discussing America's ongoing legitimacy crisis where there are certain politicians who make the system seem more broken because, well, they are part of the problem. And there are also politicians who perhaps represent the system as it should be. So that's basically what we'll be looking at today, is looking at all of those various factors. And joining me today is uh, Theophano. So, Theophano, hello, hello. how's it going? Um, so I spend a lot of time in New Mexico, and uh, I've been excited to do research on this. Um, and thanks for having me on. Yeah, of course. And uh, would you like to tell about yourself a little bit? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm a PhD student at the University of Texas. I'm specializing in late ancient and early medieval history. I'm still very early on, so I haven't made a firm decision as to where I'm going. Um, but I'm also interested in contemporary politics, and the lenses that you can use in history are also very useful when looking at contemporary politics. Hence my interest. Yeah, I agree. So I'm very excited. All right, that's pretty cool. Well, so I guess uh, we'll begin with, because we always do governor, lieutenant governor, senators, and representatives. New Mexico has a governor, a lieutenant governor, two senators, and there are only three representatives because it is a fairly small state in terms of population. Um, so uh, yeah, only about in people for a relatively large area. Um, I pulled up some information about the demographics as well. Um, the state is about 50% Hispanic and 10% Native American Indian, the rest being white. Uh, there are other small major, uh, minorities, but not much notable all populations under 30 or 40,000 people. Okay. Yeah, so it is one of the few places that I've seen, aside of from like Vermont, where you have rural areas that still support Democrats over Republicans. Yeah, and I think a lot of that, um, as what I was saying earlier, I, I think that the national republic rhetoric, or Republican rhetoric, is hostile to most of the population. Um, and even though there's still a large Catholic population, I think people are more willing to look at state policy differently here. There's a lot less hostility. Yeah, I, I definitely get the impression that New Mexico does not have an overheated political climate like a lot of the places that uh, I've looked at in the past. Definitely a lot less radicalism, especially at the state level politics, and that's kind of reflected in who they're sending to represent them on the national stage. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I wouldn't say that any of the people that we're discussing today would qualify as being radical or really even controversial, with the possible exception of the governor. But that's not really <laughs> that big of a scandal in the grand scheme of things. Right. And, you know, you don't have any, like, Marjorie Taylor Greene types or anything like that. Like, very cookie-cutter molds of politicians here, uh, for the most part. Yeah, I would say so. I mean, these aren't going to be the most... Uh, exciting politicians, frankly, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because there are only so many Lauren Boberts, Marjorie Taylor Greens, and Louis Gohmerts that you can withstand and still have a functioning republic. I think that's a really good point. Um, and these people, they're not controversial, but um, I don't think any of them particularly contribute massively to the legitimacy crisis. And Part of that probably impacts the state level politics being relatively stable. Yeah, I would say so. I say most of these people seem like genuine ish uh, people. I mean, to the extent mm -hmm. any politician could be genuine, right? Um, <laughs> and none of them seem like just a boiling uh, sore on the butt cheek of American politics. I mean, there's one guy in here I'm, I don't have a very positive impression of, but still compared to some of the people we've covered my dislike of him is rather mild i think fairly so he's uh, as you described him there's a factory making these democrats somewhere 
and yeah. unfortunately it still exists yep unfortunately uh sometimes they produce people like martin heinrich not to spoil too much here <laughs> but well would you like to start with the governor our most interesting character of the day Sure. Uh, so really, the only person who has an active scandal in the entire state at the national level is the governor, Michelle Lujan Grisham. She was born in 1959. She's a lawyer by training. She was born in Los Alamos, but mostly grew up in Santa Fe. And she comes from a political family in the state. Um, her family claims to have lived in New Mexico for the last 12 generations. So she might be one of those... Uh, long-term people who still claims the kind of peninsulari status that you were alluding to earlier before we went on the air um perhaps i i couldn't say uh some people take it more seriously than others um it would be interesting to look at uh her grandfather who was a supreme court justice and what kind of stuff he wrote uh perhaps he alludes to it yeah, and imagine, too, if, especially if you're going to be a politician in the modern era as a Democrat, if you do have aristocratic pretensions, you probably keep that on the DL. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, she... Unless you're Hillary Clinton, but that's a whole other thing. Yeah, that's a whole... I mean, that that's just somebody who doesn't really know how politics works, but got pretty far anyway. Um, so, all of her education was at the University of New Mexico. I believe she has a couple different degrees. Her dad was a dentist. So her dad was actually not all that into politics, unlike most of the rest of the family. Um, she was in state politics, and I didn't write down a lot of her roles, but I know she was quite active, and her name was a big asset. She actually lost a primary race for a House seat to a guy we'll talk about later, Martin Heinrich. But then in 2012, when he vacated the run for the Senate, she won the primary and then was automatically elected because this is a one-party state, effectively. Uh, Democrats dominate at the state and national level pretty consistently. So if you win the Democratic primary, you're pretty much golden. Um, yeah, another interesting thing to note about the way the gubernatorial election works is that the lieutenant governor runs in a separate primary from the governor, but then they run on a single ticket in the general election. So that I think that really alludes to how much of a one-party state it is because the real election is in the primary. Yes, um, I, I guess I can easily imagine what that would be like, because I remember when I was growing up, we'd visit my grandparents who were in an all-red district, and my grandpa was a Democrat, and you talk about how he had to register as a Republican so he could participate in the real election, which was the Republican primary. Uh, right, um, and my grandmother would say the same thing about uh, voting in Texas, even though she was a lifelong Democrat because she grew up during the New Deal era. Right. Yeah, I mean, so there are people who have dealt with this, and I imagine it's possible that the numbers of, uh, the registration numbers might be slightly misleading about the actual blue-to-red ratio in the state for that reason. Um, but I don't know. I feel like Republicans are less inclined to uh, register with the other party to participate in the primaries than Democrats are, but I might be wrong about that. I don't know. I definitely agree with that hunch. Um definitely more true now than ever before in general yeah um so lucian grisham was previously the secretary of health in the state uh she served until 2018 she also had a trip to baku in azerbaijan in 2016 that was a small scandal basically it was about who funded it or it was one of those little ethics investigations over taking gifts from foreign governments, which this shit happens like all the time and nobody really cares. So like mm -hmm. I said, her, this is the one scandal and it is very boring, but oh, her but opponents made a lot I of was, it. I was looking at another scandal of hers uh, that I thought was much more interesting where a former campaign staffer received a settlement for accusing her of sexual battery. Oh, that's right. Him. She grabbed the guy's crotch. Yeah. Okay. I forgot about that one. That was a little after. That was after the Baku scandal. But yes, right. this one was yeah. like something that happened during her gubernatorial campaign in 2018, which was her run for her first term. Yeah. Um. And apparently, she poured water on his crotch and then slapped and grabbed his dick. Yeah. And uh, what was great about it? Not only is he one of her campaign workers, but he's also the spokesman. This is the guy who goes and gives press releases 
and then she grabbed his dick and I guess put him in front of a microphone later. <laughs> you know, so uh, <laughs> not the best idea. If you're going to sexually harass someone, pro tip, not anyone who has a mic in their hand. Just saying. I, I think that that one, um, what was what was her name in in 16 to run against Trump? The, the lady who threw the stapler. Uh, that Klobuchar. Yeah, that was 2020. Yeah, Klo- I, I immediately thought of that when I saw this. Just like, what are you doing attacking your staff people like this? Like, get a grip. Yeah, and I guess it's because of the context. I mean, I because I think she did this in front of other people at a meeting, so most likely it was not intended to be a sexual act. It was like maybe trying to embarrass him in some way, and then it because it, she grabbed his crotch, it became sexual. I don't yeah. know. I guess I guess they've covered up the details because of whatever settlement they have. But uh, yeah, the settlement total uh, total was only one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and it came half of that from her campaign, and half from her personally so not like it like ran into the millions or anything but it's a pretty ugly incident yeah it's not great i mean and not also just the smallness of the settlement numbers you talked about in general this is not a state where there's a lot of big money in politics so the numbers we'll talk about for campaign finance and everything will be much much lower than almost any other state we've talked about it is worth noting, though, that there is a trend, like in pretty much everywhere else, I think just everywhere else, that uh, the amount of funding per race has increased dramatically over the past decade. Oh, yeah. And that's been true nationwide. I remember uh, when I was an undergrad doing political science as a minor, I took a class around maybe 2007. We talked about the average cost of a House race and a Senate race. A Senate race usually around a million bucks for the winner. And then a house race is usually around two hundred fifty, three hundred thousand. And uh those numbers are comically low now compared to what the average is. Yeah, if I remember correctly, um Grisham's campaign in twenty twenty two for re election received fourteen million dollars, um, including a sizable contribution from Deloitte, um, famous for data breaches and advocacy for all of the worst people. Yeah. Um so that's how you know that uh, you're in a one-party state when you have the same person taking money from them who also gets the support of the union machinist. Right. And um, I also noticed a pretty big chunk of money from real estate developers. Yep. Uh, the state has seen um, an increase in population growth since she took office in 2018, um, at least according to estimates based off the 2020 census. Um, and a lot of that is also tied up in the donations we receive from law firms because these law firms are supporting the real estate companies and trying to chip away at federal land because federal land makes up about 30 to 35 percent of all of the land in New Mexico. And so chipping away at that for development or um, especially resource extraction in the northwest and in the Permian Basin in the southeast, there's a lot of oil, um, there's uranium, uh, so strategic resources, and there are people who want to take away land from Native American reservations and national forest preserves to get at these resources, and they support her. She hasn't really done anything on it yet, but it's worth pointing out that there is that pressure. Right, and I mean, there are some of the people we'll talk about who are very much on the side of the Native Americans, but they are representing New Mexico in Congress, so they have no direct ability to put pressure on the governor, but indirectly, I guess they can. Um, Right, and the governor can put pressure on, like, federal-level administrators in the state, people who are, like, overseeing, say, Bureau of Land Management land in the west part of the state. Most of the west part of the state is where the government land is. Um, There's also, of course, very large military bases, like the uh, Los Alamos and uh, White Sands areas. Right. And um, she also... uh, So... For her land policy clearly is favoring large money, but her environmental policy is actually fairly progressive, which actually seems to be a staple of New Mexico politics. Um, so she signed an executive order called the Energy Transition Act, which will mandate 50% renewable energy by 2030, which is a pretty bold goal, mm-hmm. and 100% uh, zero carbon by 2045. Um, Yeah, and her social policy has also been geared in the same direction, um, basically in line with what a national democratic 
platform looks like for the most part, but like that stuff isn't achievable at that level. So she got a special session to legalize pot after a vote stalled out and repeal the law from the 60s banning abortion. And, you know, as a female governor, I can't say I'm surprised, but like, you know, she took a few bold political moves in order to make that happen. So kudos to her for that. Yeah, I remember she was also one of the sort of dark horses in the uh, Biden deep stakes back when he promised he'd pick a woman. I don't remember that, but it doesn't surprise me. I mean, he brought in a few women from New Mexico. Uh, Deb Holland, I believe, was a former senator, is now the Secretary of the Interior, and she's a Native American woman from one of the reservations in New Mexico. So her advocacy on the issue has been pretty decent, to say the least. So the, the history of the political climate that we see right now is there in huh. the past 21st century, let's say. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so overall, I feel like with Lucian Grisham, she's kind of what I would think of as your very typical Democratic governor. Someone who will respond to obvious problems in a fairly predictable manner. And then when it comes to her action on abortion and weed, that's all significant but at the same time it seems like all these things should have been done many years ago and she's kind of just doing something that easily could have been done back in the 90s um so yes yeah, we're still playing catch up and i guess that's also just symptomatic of american politics that we're doing things that the public would have supported a long time ago mm -hmm. well after the fact now this has become the overwhelming majority opinion especially in a blue state so, I mean, I feel like yeah. she's done popular measures, which is always a good thing, but at the same time, it's kind of an indictment of her predecessors. Agreed. Um, I mean, Gary Johnson used to be the governor here, so um, any yeah. self-avowed libertarian in charge of a state is probably not going to use the state's power to do anything. Although you would uh, think they'd want to legalize pot, because usually most libertarians are pro-legalization. Very true. I, th I don't know if the attitudes were different, but there is definitely a libertarian streak in among more conservative types in New Mexico. I think that makes getting these democratic reforms through through the state apparatus a little easier. Yeah, I think you're right. I, I forgot to mention, there was another little scandal where um, she took state money that was supposed to be for like travel and security for the governor and spend it on groceries. Oh, yeah, that's $6,500, so... Yeah, another minor one, but, you know, it's like... She fits the mold, like, you know, just, just this corruption here and there sprinkled in along with, like, the generic ticket of items that you want to see from a Democrat. Yeah, I mean, and I feel like in some ways you could even say she's almost like the Hillary of this state in the sense that most of her scandals probably aren't even that big of a deal, and then there might be a couple that are more troubling... It's just that she has a tendency to do dumb things, and that scene with this grocery thing, because, I mean, this is... I don't even know how she committed this, but I assume, based on the small amount of the uh, sum spent, that this was a mistake. Yeah, or that it was... Yeah, probably, maybe a staffer using the wrong account or something. I, I don't know. The information isn't available. Yeah, and also, uh, I mean, she must have been hosting some serious fucking party for $6,500 on one grocery bill. I mean, even with inflation being what it is, holy shit. Oh, yeah, apparently a lot of it was booze, so. Yeah, must have been buying some high-end stuff. It's no kidding. Probably uh, hosting the donors, right? <laughs> yeah, probably so. Probably hosting some of her donors. Um, and probably not the New Mexico Federation of Teachers, either. <laughs> Uh, that seems like a nice segue to our lieutenant governor. Yeah, so, uh, also, how do you want to rank Illusion Grisham? Ah, uh, yeah, I forgot we're doing the tier list. I mean, she seems like a C to me. Yeah, that's maybe, what I was thinking, too. Her scandals kind of, kind of pull, like, pull her back from a B for me, but, like, I mean, the resistance to change despite the donors on land issues, and then, like, getting abortion and pot when she was in Congress, and this isn't really relevant to her tenure as governor, she did support an increase in the minimum wage. Right. Um, yes, I mean, she's, she's got some good stuff on her record. She's also done some dumb shit, so yeah, I would say C is pretty fair for her. Um, and also, I feel like if you're just looking for a generic governor, she's kind of fits the bill. 
if you're just trying to cast somebody in a movie as just, here's Governor Y, who just filled the seat, did a few things, and had a few scandals, and just kind of there. Yeah. I, I mean, I imagine that she'll probably, she's relatively young. Uh, so I imagine that she'll probably run for re-election again. I don't know what the term limit policy is in New Mexico. I want to say it's two terms, but I could be wrong. Um, so then in that case, she's serving out her second term. So we'll see if she spices things up in the future. But I I don't expect anything. Maybe she'll try to get some gun laws passed or uh, some kind of health care stuff. Um, who knows? I could see a gun law. Either that or... She might get reelected and then just start trying to put her name out there as a vice presidential candidate again. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's clear that she does have greater ambitions, although with the little scandals on her record, that will make it a little tougher. But yeah, those get blown up in the bigger stages. Right, because I mean, those can easily be spun and made to look way worse than they actually are. Yeah, especially if you admitted guilt by paying out. Yeah, because then if she's running against, because I mean, it seems like every time the Republicans choose someone like Trump as a lot of those allegations, and the thing is, because of the media's tendency to do false equivalencies, her one sex scandal would make it impossible to attack an opponent who has like a thousand. Right. <laughs> so, you know, she, that's a major liability, and I really hope that it, you know, whoever is nominated is wise enough to not look her direction for VP. Um, but speaking of her equivalent of a VP, that would be Lieutenant Governor Howie Morales. And um, he actually has a PhD from New Mexico State. He was born in 1973. He is a public school teacher who specializes in special ed. His dad was a copper miner and his mom was a special education assistant, which is a very hard job, by the way. My mom did that for one year. And um, a lot of that job is wrestling kids who have intellectual disabilities and behavioral issues. Um, he, w he became a very successful high school baseball coach. So he made it to the Hall of Fame, I think the youngest person ever to be inducted. Fairly short career, but won a lot. Um, he became the, he was appointed, he was county clerk. Then he was appointed to the state senate when there was an opening by Bill Richardson, who is kind of a legend in New Mexico, but everybody else in the country finds him to be boring. Um, so Howie was reelected twice to the Senate. He also administered a hospital at one point. He's an advocate of single payer. So that, but in New Mexico specifically, so he wants to do like a New Mexico Medicare for all equivalent. Uh, he is with a, the, with the tax rates, what they are in New Mexico, I can see a lot of pushback. Um, I don't think we talked at all about tax rates, but they're very, very low in New Mexico. There is an income tax that is a tiered system, but it caps out at about 5%. Oh. And they have a property tax system that also caps out, like it, it uses a different counting method that I, don't, I can't say that I actually understand, but the effective rate is basically 1%. Um, oh. And then they have a sales tax that also includes services, but it is also low. Hmm. Yeah, he is also a critic of standardized test, and he wants to, or he did, I guess, implement a tax on cigarettes and vapes that raised $89 million for education, and he convinced Governor Lucian Grisham to get rid of standardized testing, which, of course, means teachers are now more free to focus on learning rather than having to gear everything toward a test and doing lots of review uh, to drill kids to take a test. Um, also, yeah, I, very short record. Um, yeah, he's young, um, and he spent a lot of time doing things that are basically just social service work, which is admirable. Um, yeah. It's shocking to see somebody like this in politics. I guess it makes sense in a state level. It's more common. Right. Um, but he seems like a generally good guy, and his policy initiatives uh, and advocacy are all like progressive and uh, generally pushing pushing the needle forward on quality of life in the state. So, yeah, that's pretty nice. 
Yeah, he's an interesting fellow, but, you know, he's also... I never thought I'd see somebody with his resume as lieutenant governor unless they were appointed after the previous person died or something. So I'm actually surprised yeah, he was ever on the ballot. Special ed teacher and baseball coach. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very uh, small resume considering the usual... I mean, because most lieutenant governors are either long-time politicians, so it'd be kind of like the state equivalent of, say, LBJ's selection to be JFK's running mate, mm -hmm. or it's somebody who's another up-and-comer. Whereas in his case, this is his first major position, so... It's... I imagine that... Um, I haven't listened to him speak. Uh, I imagine that he must have some pretty big upside charisma. Yeah, I mean, that could do it. Uh, that can make up for a lot. I, I think you would have to be to be a coach, special ed teacher, like the roles that he served prior to being lieutenant governor definitely indicate that he might have some of that. Yeah, that he has the, the touch with people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that could be it. Um, so he could be someone who's passionate and charismatic and can help sell legislation for the governor. Um that being said, I think he's still very new in the role, so he hasn't really done a whole hell of a lot. And in terms of his donors, I couldn't find anything, because I mean, his, his campaign was very, very cheap. Uh-huh. Yeah, I can't imagine that the lieutenant governor um, primary is a super hot ticket for donors. Yeah, I think I think his campaign was somewhere in the low tens of thousands, from what I remember. I didn't even bother writing it down, but it was something like maybe twenty thousand bucks, if that. Yeah, and I don't know if we pointed it out here already, but the lieutenant governor and the governor run in separate primaries and then run on a joint ticket uh, in the general election, which is a little different, um, but in a state where the primary contest is the decider of who wins the election, it kind of makes sense, I guess. Yeah, and it's also interesting because, um, you know, that these two might not have ever known each other before this, and they might have only met because of them both being the victors in their respective races. So I wonder right. I wonder if that was like Lucian Grisham's way of winning his friendship was, uh, you know, following his advice on standardized tests. Because I think that was one of the first things she did was to enact his priority of... Uh, getting rid of standardized test. And I guess that's one thing that she was probably actually able to accomplish unilaterally. Um, that's more of, I think generally more an executive branch prerogative with education. So. Yeah. I mean, this guy, if he got rid of generalized tests and that's advertised among students, I mean, that means every year for the next several years, voters coming of age are going to be grateful. So, I mean, he's going to be killing the youth vote such as it is at the state level. You know, so like all, That's a really all, great point. Yeah, all like 15 new high school graduates want to go vote for state offices. I mean, they're going to be big Morales fans. <laughs> I mean, I think it also speaks to his experience in education and seeing that uh, underserved communities from an education perspective perform much worse on standardized testing. And it's not really representative of their capabilities. Uh, especially because the state is majority Hispanic, so like it's very relevant to his state. Yeah, because I mean there is a you know, common belief that uh, you know a lot of standardized testing favors white people because of the assumptions of the questions, mm -hmm. um, like language and just yep. general knowledge. Stuff. Yep. Uh, I mean, I always thought that some of the standardized testing might favor psychopaths, because I remember there was one question where the analogy is cat is to hammer as, and then there were other choices. Um, hmm. And like, yeah, I don't think cats and hammers need to be together. <laughs> I don't know about that. Yeah, my, my cats might have something to say about that. <laughs> yeah, so. But anyway, uh, yeah, I mean, Morales, he's a little untested at this point. But, mm -hmm. you know, still, he would be somebody, if you saw him in your state, you would think, well, he seems like a pretty cool guy. Even though you'd probably be a little worried, say, if uh, Lucian Grisham died and then he took over as governor because, because of his inexperience. Mm -hmm. I don't, and it's hard to gauge his ambition as well. 
right. uh, just because of his lack of experience, you know, like certain actions that might be taken by more ambitious people. Well, he hasn't taken them, but it's also too early to tell. Yeah, because he's not a resume patter the way a lot of these people are. Mm -hmm. um, so he hasn't done nearly as much, you know, doing like a DC think tank and uh, meeting all the movers and shakers. and Right, like he went to school and got his advanced degree all in New Mexico. So like he's not going to Stanford or Yale like uh, Grisham did. Right, so he's not going out to meet other elites who will become governors in Massachusetts or whatever. Mm -hmm. so, so it gives him less political clout outside of the state. Right, exactly. So I, mean, I think that he's an interesting guy, though, um, and that he has some potential to do some good things. Um, as far as like him and the legitimacy crisis go, I don't really think he's a contributor at all. Like he's very homegrown. I agree. No, I don't think he contributes at all to that. If anything, he would be a counterweight. Right. Which makes me tempted to say, like, A or even S. But, like, S seems like you'd have to go yeah. above and beyond. I mean, I think for S, he'd need to be a real superstar. Like, somebody that people outside the state actually know. And I'm not even, I don't even know for sure if people inside the state really pay attention to the lieutenant governor. Mm -hmm. uh, but that being said, if they do look into him, they'll be like, yeah, that guy seems legitimate. Yeah, I mean, he was in the New Mexico Senate for a decade. So, oh, like, yeah, he's so. been around the scene. Yeah. But, yeah, not super high profile, just keeping his head down and trying to get the things that he thinks are right, I guess. Yeah, I mean, so I think that if, even if you disagreed with him, if you looked at him, I think you'd probably come away with the impression that he's genuine. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to our next guy, um, this is, I would say, the most plastic of the New Mexico politicians, and that would be <laughs> Senator Martin Heinrich, uh 1970, born 1971. Uh, he's actually from Nevada originally, which is true of another person as well we'll get into later. He's a businessman. And one interesting thing about him, he has never lost a political contest in his entire career. So he started on the Albuquerque City Council, then he went to the U.S. House, and then the U.S. Senate. And he's been in the Senate since 2013. So in many ways, he calls himself a businessman, but he's really a career politician. That's probably a better descriptor. He, uh, he definitely was a businessman. Um, his, one of his biggest campaign contributions was from himself. Um, he worked for a nonprofit for a while, and I think he made some, some money in oil, if I'm not wrong. Um, that sounds right. He, I know he also got a lot of money from Pattern Energy, which also does wind and solar, though. Yeah, and, like, wind and solar have huge development potential in New Mexico. Yeah. Um, it would be interesting to see if he has any kind of business relationship with those industries, like, on the side. Could be. Uh, wouldn't be surprising to me, but... Yeah, he. Uh, I noticed, too, pretty much all the New Mexico politicians are pro-wind and solar, and then some of them are also in the oil and gas, but... I think it's just a given that all of them are in the wind and solar if they're Democrats. Mm -hmm. And there's just a lot of land that can be utilized for that there, um, given all the rural space and the higher elevation. These right. things are going to be more valuable here. No, that's true. And I remember, uh, well, I haven't been in New Mexico proper, but I have been to Nevada and Arizona. And um, there you can definitely see big solar farms out along the side of the highway. and. You know, that right. land's not going to do anything I'm, else. I'm from Austin, Texas, and when I drive um, out to Utah to look at archaeological Native American sites, um, you will start passing a lot of wind farms starting in West Texas, continuing into New Mexico, like that entire corridor. Ah. Yeah, there's a lot of those in Indiana as well, wind farms, that is. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and I know that I've heard the biggest complaint I've ever heard about them is that they're tacky. And uh, I just don't think that's a very valid critique, though. No, I, I agree. It's, it's not very valid, especially when if you're driving, say, the 12 hours to get from Austin to the New Mexico border, as soon as you leave Austin, you're not going to see much. So, frankly, the wind farms are more exciting. Yeah, uh, it's, it's better than nothing. Um, I remember when I w went to college, uh, in the mountains, there was a big wind 
uh, mill that was on top of one of the mountains that generated a lot of energy. But some of the locals complained the locals had bought really expensive chateaus that it blocked their view and it wasn't natural, so they had it removed. I've heard similar things from wealthy coastal residents who don't like um, offshore turbines, which are very efficient because of the natural change in pressure over the ocean. Right. Um, but they don't like them because the complaint, the same one, it's tacky. Yeah, it's like, well, you know, look at something else because you got a big bay window, I'm sure. So Yeah, like, <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry for you. There are other things you can potentially focus on or... Uh, you know, have your fancy family portraits taken in front of. You can just angle yourselves a little differently. It's not that big of a deal. Just Photoshop it out anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, just like when you Photoshop out any kind of wrinkles or whatever the fuck. Um, so, yeah, there you go. Uh, advice for the wealthy. You're welcome. Because I know that the wealthy definitely watch this channel nonstop. Oh, yeah, they're all over it. Yeah, I can tell. So... <laughs> Um, all right. So in terms of Heinrich's uh, policies, well, one of the things he's most famous for, actually, is that he did a sort of publicity trip with Senator Jeff Blake from Arizona for Discovery Channel, and they did like a little wilderness survival thing for a few days, and it was just supposed to show bipartisanship. So yeah, they went out... 2014, so we're talking the era of, like, late Obama, where the Republicans are really starting to ramp things up, and, you know, we had just gotten past that huge clash over deficit and austerity and... Sequesters the, and... The shutdown, like, so I think it, it probably seems, it seems to me like a good faith attempt, like, what, they went to the Marshall Islands for six days? Yeah. Yeah, no. Um, it was a different era, though. Like, it's so hard to look at it now and, like, think that it's real. Yeah, I mean, it's a little, it was a little goofy, but at the same time, given the environment, especially, I think that's the same year where Ted Cruz shut down the government, even after uh, McConnell made a deal with Obama, and then Ted Cruz is like, I'm going to shut down the government anyway, so make me president. Yeah. <laughs> and that's partly why the Republicans wouldn't rally around Cruz to defeat Trump in 2016, is because he defied McConnell. It's okay, they had their backup, Marco Rubio. Yeah, uh, charismatic back. Marco, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and especially, I mean, they had the heavy hitter himself, Jeb Bush. So there was no way that guy was going to lose. Yeah, oh, no way. I mean, just the name recognition on its own, wow. <laughs> I feel like that's the one time where name recognition was, all they needed to see was the last name, and then people just said, no. Nah. Yeah. Pass. <laughs> That's the taste that you got in your mouth after 2007. Yeah. Um, let's see. So, in terms of his views, he co-sponsored Medicare for All, actually, in 2017. So, I think he co-sponsored it with Bernie, maybe? I don't remember who he did it with, but... um. So, yeah, that was a big deal at the time. Uh, he also gets money from Pattern Energy. We mentioned them earlier. Wind and Solar. Freedom Road, LLC, which is a Colorado-based weed uh, farm. Also, Next Era Energy, which is, in theory, for the decarbonization of America. He also gets money from Democracy Engine, which is some sort of donation tool. I'm not sure I fully understand exactly how it works. And uh, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a platform that allows people to donate who are more single-issue voters. And so you can, like, direct your money towards issues and, like, they distribute it for you. But, like, if you care about, say, abortion issues, they'll put it in battleground states or places where they think that it's going to be useful or just where they have friends. I'm not really sure how ethical the platform is. Yeah, I mean, I do I do notice that I haven't really seen it before, so it might be relatively new, and it seems to be very prominent with these New Mexico politicians. Right. Yeah, I hadn't heard of it either. Um, but apparently they've got some clout here. And then they also he also gets money from the American Healthcare Association, and I looked on their site. I don't find their views to be very clear, so I'm not really sure exactly what they're advocating. I mean, if we're talking, if it was the '90s, it would be like tort reform, but yeah, I, I don't really know what they're about now. Also, that was the same group that was for tort reform in the '90s. Okay, I didn't know that. Well, I mean, they wanted to make sure that doctors were a little safer from lawsuits 
Ah, yeah. I remember uh, George W. Bush tried to campaign on that, too, as if people know slash care what tort reform is about. Right, and it's not a particularly inspiring issue, but they were definitely behind it in the 90s. Um, especially, you know, that was like peak of the pharmaceutical industry, dumping money into propaganda. Yeah, but I can never, I, I wish somebody would ask one of the Republicans back in the 90s, so tort reform, can you explain it basically? Well, if your doctor does your back surgery and fucks up and you end up not being able to walk, you can't sue him. Why would I want that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and your doctor's also making like half a million a year. And if if it happened to them, they'd certainly be able to sue. Right. So it's basically like, yeah, we, we prevent class action lawsuits uh, for that. Or if some company dumps toxins in your area and everybody gets cancer. Yeah, ask ask the Navajo in New Mexico how that went. Yeah, um, or, or there's people... a very, very famous incident from the 50s. It's famous within the Navajo community. Um, so there was like a huge like uranium waste spill and not to mention that for the past like decade before that, like uranium miners who were mostly Navajo, uh, were treated very poorly. And the Navajo nation is one of the largest, if not the largest, I can't, I'm not actually sure, but it's, it's a huge swath of territory that spans all four of the four corner states, including a big chunk of Northwestern New Mexico. And so there have been numerous lawsuits from the Navajo Nation over water poisoning and individual damages to people who worked in government-owned uranium mines, and none of them have succeeded. In fact, just a couple weeks ago, there was a case over water access that they lost in court that they don't have access to a certain part of the southern Colorado River um, that it needs to be used for agriculture that's outside of their land. Right. So them getting screwed is par for the course, but, like, tort reform, to tie back into that, would have screwed them even more. Oh, absolutely. I mean, tort reform is literally a poison pill in the purest sense. I mean, they used to just list it off, like Newt Gingrich and all those kind of guys. It's just like, oh, yeah, something America needs. And just because it has the name reform in it, not that many people ask follow-up questions. Well, if it's reform, it must be fixing something, obviously. Right? Yeah. Fixing a problem for the wealthy's ability to extract money from people. Exactly, yeah. It must be some fix because it has reform in it, so... I guess the Republicans are always very good at marketing, though. I'll give them that. Yeah, they know they know how to navigate language. Yeah, and the Democrats, for whatever reason, didn't hit back on that issue. So I feel like that's the easiest issue in the world to pants them on. Right. Uh, I mean, you know, like, I guess that was in an era... I guess we have to spice up this conversation about New Mexico with like totally external stuff because it doesn't have that much to it. But yeah, um, <laughs> but I think that they were on that Bill Clinton wave and Bill Clinton was all about capitulation to Republicans. If we're, if we're yeah. looking at the Nazis here. Yeah, when it, when it came to economic issues, I mean, Bill Clinton was ready to pull out the white flag. If anything, I feel like he pulled out the white flag before they even showed up. Yeah. Oh no, he was he was ready to get the onboarding process before he even showed up in office. We can deregulate. It's, I'm fine with that. I have no objections. You guys I mean, want deregulation? I, I think you had a video where <laughs> I love the Bill Clinton voice. He's a beautiful man. Now you just need to learn how to play the saxophone. Yeah, unfortunately, I have a severe ten ear, so playing any kind of instrument is not happening. <laughs> well. <laughs> Yeah. Um, yeah, I think he had, I think he had already capitulated before he got into office, but he 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 also capitulated on social issues like crime bill and general anti-gay rhetoric during like the late stages of the AIDS crisis. So just there was no Democratic Party during the 90s in many ways. There was no opposition. Yeah, it was basically moderate Republicans and right-wing Republicans, and that was about it. And to a certain extent, that has gotten a little better, but it hasn't fundamentally changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some actual left-wingers now, but they just don't have any power. Yeah, what I read something that was like, there are more self-avowed socialists now in the U.S. legislature than there were even during the 30s. 
So that's interesting, but um, it's the number is still tiny. Yeah, the number's tiny, and the policy impact is hard to detect. Right. Versus, I, I think the difference now between Democrat and Republican is the Republicans have taken more effort to separate themselves from the Democrats, despite the Democrats trying to close the distance. Yeah, the Democrats try to close the distance. Republicans are like, well, wait, let's let's do some crazy shit now. Yeah. <laughs> let's see how far they'll go. Fuck it. Let's let's see what happens. Yeah, let's let's get on board with a guy who denies Sandy Hook or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so with uh, Martin Heinrich, even though he was a co-sponsor for Medicare for All, um, he also, and his website comes across as very much an ACA guy, so Obamacare. And he mm-hmm. has uh, sponsors and things with Amy Klobuchar and Peter Welch to allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices, which is a good piece of policy. But again, it seems like he may have backed off from Medicare for All to go more of just let's build upon the ACA with baby steps. Um, in his economic messaging, he's very, very slippery. He doesn't mention unions one time and just says, basically, we need a strong economy and jobs. So it's like the most generic statement you could possibly imagine. <laughs> and um, he also says that wind and solar should be a bigger deal in New Mexico, which I think is like the most New Mexico position possible. Yeah, I, I don't think any of the politicians that we encountered in this examination are opposed to it. In fact, they're all very pro wind and solar. And I'd be interested to know if the Republicans in the state are also pro wind and solar, because I feel like just because it's New Mexico, they might be. Yeah, my general my general opinion is that they tend to support the oil, coal, like, you know, traditional fossil fuel industries because they're more entrenched in press and wind and solar are upstarts. Um just from a more ideological perspective. But I don't like if it's an opportunity to make money, like I don't see why they wouldn't be opposed to them, you know. Like they're always very pro economic growth. Yeah, and I mean, as long as there's money to be had out of that industry, I don't think the Republicans are going to have too many qualms about taking money from them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so long as it doesn't conflict too much with the money they receive from oil and gas, right? Yeah, I guess unless, uh, you know, they feel like the the wind and solar people are too woke. Yeah. <laughs> uh, which, you know, I don't know exactly how having a solar panel is woke, but, you know, whatever. I guess that makes Elon Musk woke. It's very much over for him. Yeah, no, he, he's, you get, uh, well, I guess, you know, the go woke, go broke thing. I mean, he has lost him a lot of money on Twitter, so maybe that's what's happening. You're right. It's because of the solar panels. Yeah, that's what uh, it is. Um, the solar panels and the car batteries. Right there. Yeah, there you go. I mean, solve the problem. <laughs> uh, all right, so that's about all I have on Martin Heinrich. Do you have anything else? Um, I don't have much on it. Um, as far as social policy, um, him on same-sex marriage and stuff like same-sex marriage, transgender issues, he has also been very slippery. He's like declared support and then been very tepid about action. Right. Um, besides that, I don't really have much. He's cookie cutter Democrat. Yeah, I think you're right. I feel like most a lot of his positions he copy pasted and then he edited to make more ambiguous and less committal. Yeah, he's so I I would argue that he's been out of the state a lot. Um, he went to school in Missouri. Uh, he's from Nevada, so he has like unlike um, our our friend who's the lieutenant governor. Oh, I think Morales, yeah. Moral, unlike Morales, um, he's a little more cosmopolitan elite, and so that allows him to fit that cookie cutter mold very, very smoothly. Yeah, I'm inclined to agree. Um, and I feel like he's another guy. If you just imagine a generic Democrat in a movie, a Democratic senator, mm-hmm. or hell, even like a Republican senator, almost. I mean, just any random politician. It could just be Martin Heinrich. Yeah, he just copy paste the answer, and that was his uh, cameo for the movie. Yeah, and he also kind of looks like he would be an actor playing a politician. 
<laughs> yeah, he's got the he's got the jawline for it. Yeah, he's got kind of like the chiseled looks and everything. So I mean, he actually does look more like an actor playing a politician than an actual politician. <laughs> um, if I were to tier rank him, I think I would probably give him a D. He's not atrocious. I don't think he deserves to go any lower than D. Right. No, I, I agree. I think he's about a D. Just and part of it is just because he just comes across as being slimy. There's not really any one mm-hmm. thing I can really point to. It's just the general impression I get is, you know, this guy is on the take. He's a careerist. Um, mm-hmm. He doesn't really care about political outcomes that much. He's all in it for himself. Right, especially as a guy who was in business himself before and serves on a lot of, or has served on a lot of political committees in Congress. Um, he's He's in the muck. Oh, yeah. I feel like he's the kind of guy, uh, he's not like a lunatic or anything, so if there was a situation where he could avoid a nuclear catastrophe and he was in charge of making the decision, he'd probably make the right decision. But then his justification later would be, well, I mean, dead people can't be appreciative of my greatness, so you know, I had to save the world. They can't pay taxes <laughs> either or yeah, they can't. donate to my campaign. Exactly. I mean, they're not going to build statues of me if they're dead, so I had to save mm-hmm. them. <laughs> Um, and next up, we have the junior senator, who has only been in office since 2022. Or, wait, no, yeah, late 2022, so he's inaugurated this year. Uh, and that would be, am I, I think I have that right. No, yeah, he was elected in 2020, sorry. Uh, but that would be Ben Ray Lusion. And I do not believe he is related to the governor. He is not. He has come out and addressed that and said, we are not cousins. All right. Uh, I think the governor's middle name is Lujan, and right. his last name is Lujan, but there's like a little accent over the A. Right, yeah, you're right. So it's uh, more a, it's like a definite Hispanic last name. Ah. So was, uh, Grisham is the last name of the governor. Right. Oh, the Grisham's, you know, her husband's name, uh, I think. Ah, uh, yeah. But anyway, um, so Ben Ray, born in 1972. Um, one thing that comes up immediately when you research him, he had a stroke in February 2022. So pretty young to have a stroke at age 50. Um, but he has, I think, made a full recovery as far as I know. Certainly uh, he's had a lot easier of a recovery than um, Fetterman from Pennsylvania. who's yeah. had, you know, a hell of a I time. To see. Yeah. Um, so Ben Ray... Was, is from Santa Fe. His dad was a politician in the New Mexico House of Reps and even became speaker. Uh, he was a blackjack dealer coming out of high school at a tribal casino, so he has a fairly strong link to the Native American community. Um, he then went to University of New Mexico. He got his uh, BBA from New Mexico Highlands University. I'm not sure exactly what a BBA is, but uh, must be a bachelor's uh, business administration. Ah, there, there we go. Yeah, bachelor's business administration. I've never heard of that one. Usually, it just say BA in business administration. But... Yeah, it's it's from what I understand, it's like the bachelor equivalent of an MBA. All right, that's a new one to me. All right. Um. <laughs> so he then was elected to the New Mexico Public Regulation Commission. He was elected chair very early on by his peers because he recognized he had some leadership qualities. He was chair for three years, 2005, 6, and 7. Um, he increased the amount needed for renewables. And he was then in the House from 2008 to 2020. And once again, you know, he probably had a, a competitive primary, but then after that, he was the nominee, cruised the re-election each time. Um, so in the House, he backed the public option during the health care debate under Obama. He also pushed for withdrawal from Afghanistan, and he didn't really do all that much in the House, from what I can tell. Uh, I don't really have too much on his 12 years there. But... Um, okay, well, I, I have a little bit, um, mostly related to Native American stuff. Um, he wanted to redirect federal funds and put more into the hands of tribal leaders rather than federal administrators. Ah. Uh. Um which makes sense given his ties, and I think that's pretty commendable stuff. Um, and 
he also worked to protect um, archaeological sites in an area called Chaco Canyon, which I visited and is very beautiful. They wanted to chop down the size of the preserve to allow for oil and gas drilling, and he opposed that. Ah, oh, that's definitely good. Yeah, no, because some of them are sacred sites, and a lot of them are just valuable archaeological resources for the study of the ancestral Puebloan people. Right, for real. Um, yeah, I actually uh, learned a little bit about that one with the Grand Canyon, and um, I didn't get to go to Chaco Canyon, but I know that there's a lot of stuff there for the ancestral Pueblans. Um, yeah, um, I'm very much into that. I actually just took a trip out there in March, um, into Utah mostly, but there are sites scattered across all four of the four corner states and uh there's some very interesting stuff like they were engaged in long range trade with the uh, central american or mesoamerican states like you can find like the bones of uh tropical birds in some of these sites that were brought all the way from modern day yucatan peninsula that's pretty cool i didn't know that yeah and that's without horses or anything like we're talking hand carried or in a cage or something anyway that's pretty cool um all right well um so he in the senate uh when he first started in 2021 he joined some republicans actually to block a ban on hydraulic fracking so uh he is pro fracking um or at least uh, anti the consequences of opposing donors. Yeah, which is the same thing, effectively. Yeah, right. Um, so for all of you know the good things he does for Native Americans, he apparently is not opposed to the destruction of the land. Um, he also he's kind of a quiet politician overall, I'd say. Um, so he his actual record is pretty limited he doesn't make a lot of headlines but if you read his site he claims that he is very much in favor of strengthening unions mm -hmm. um he also says that he wants to invest in national labs and bases in new mexico which is a fairly standard position actually in that state um, yeah, defense spending yeah so he also is an aca guy um he wants to improve it so it's a little bit of a i guess what you could call a you know what's the word weasel words um, but he does want to create a public option where you can buy in the Medicaid and he does want to lower drug prices. So he's kind of, I guess at this point, that's a standard democratic position is to either create a public option or just to improve medic, uh, the ACA, which is rather vague, but at least he has a little bit of specifics. So I'll give him some credit there. Yeah, um, any policy proposals I've seen on improvement generally involve, like, a, a, another Medicaid expansion, like a Part E. Um, and it right now in the political climate doesn't seem feasible, so it's very easy to just talk about it and no, see absolutely zero documents about what right. that entails. Right, and, no, and not even, like, a little bullet point list. <laughs> um, and... So he does have a strong stand on Social Security, which is good, though. So he <laughs> is he, he proposes something called the Social Security 2100 Act, and the idea is to protect and expand uh, the coverage of Social Security and make sure it's solvent all the way to 2100. And that's a pretty strong stance on that, because I don't know of anyone else who has something quite that strong and that looks to that date, so... Uh, that, I guess, could be one of his standout pieces of uh, advocacy. Yeah, I, I also think that he's, at least verbally, um, very, very vocal about uh, energy policy. Um, yeah. Obviously, he voted against fracking bans, um, but he does get high scores from environmentalist groups in terms of their like voting suggestions or whatever you call them. Right, they're like scorecards or, yeah. Right. I think the Sierra Club in particular values him. Um, although, I don't know exactly why. Yeah, the Sierra Club, uh, from what I understand, tends to lean a little bit more Republican, but they're Republicans who want to protect the environment. Yeah, and like the Teddy Roosevelt mold. 
Right, yeah. Um, he, uh... Oh, another thing that he's co-sponsored is the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, which is would have been a huge piece of labor legislation. I didn't catch that. Wow. So, yeah, that is a big deal, because if that had passed, it would make it, I think, illegal to fire somebody for union activity at, at work. Um, so that would have been a huge step forward for labor. And I want to say Biden sort of tepidly endorsed it. Then again, with Biden, because of, you know, his advanced state of uh, decay, it's hard to tell sometimes exactly how vigorously he is for or not for something. Right, because sometimes he'll he'll endorse something and do nothing, and then sometimes he'll take some executive actions that are actually kind of significant. Yeah, you so, never know what you're going to get. Right, I was, I was literally about to say the same thing. He's um, hard to read in his advanced age. Yeah, I feel like at a certain point, because of his irascible nature, I wonder if there's a certain point where somebody pisses him off and calls him a leftist and he doesn't like it, he'll be like, you know what, fuck you, Jack. Medicare for all. Suck it. <laughs> yeah. One can hope. Yeah. Because <laughs> actually I feel like there there's a universe where John McCain became president, and because his politics are all about avenging personal insult, um, you know, his party would say he's too moderate, so then he just endorses full blown socialism. I I could see that. Like he did not brook insult. No, I mean he was he was a very very petty man. But it's like it's weird because the times when he chose to be petty were his best moments, uh, and not for the right reasons, but they were his best mm -hmm. moments. Um, so like the, when he upheld the ACA, it was literally just to tell Trump to go fuck himself. So it was his dying action. Yep, his literal dying act was. Yep. So, um, you know, but if you're just talking about like, the rationality of his actions, it was it was all just to own the people who were attacking him from the right. That was it. That was the only reason he did the vote. And otherwise, he'd have voted party line. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I there was always this conversation around McCain that he was some kind of maverick, especially towards the end of his life. But if you look at his voting record, he really wasn't. Yeah, he was never a he, maverick. He's just a... I'm trying to think, what was the Democrat? That's what the word is. Uh, he votes Democrat. based on his honor. Uh, uh, and it's, it's not just honor in like some sort of stoic philosophical sense, but more his personal honor. Um, so that, that's, that's, that determines whether you got his vote or not. So he'll vote right wing unless you piss him off. Yeah, definitely a soldier's honor too. Very easy to agree. Yeah, no, I mean, McCain is uh, McCain was a very sensitive man. Um my friends. Uh, let's see. <laughs> yeah, so I, I guess um, Lujan also wants to move away from oil and gas eventually, but in the meantime, he wants to protect workers. And he took credit for trying to get uh, money to workers who are out of work due to COVID, so oil and gas workers in particular. So I guess yeah. he's trying to have it both ways on that. Based on his actions, um, it seems like a lot of what he's focused on in Congress is appropriations. Um, and it seems like that's also what he was doing when he was in lower levels of government. Um, so he's interested in, like, not just disputing the purpose of the money, but, like, just trying to, like, strong arm people or, like, cajole people into getting the money to go where he wants it to go or for the purposes that he seems fit. So... He seems to be quite decent at that. So you think he's kind of more of a backroom guy when in terms of how he gets stuff done? Right, right. That's just his modus operandi. That makes sense. And I mean, a lot of the guys I mean, he who was a understand. Blackjack dealer. That's true. Yeah, he he does know how casinos work. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that's uh, that could be it. I mean, he might be a guy who's sort of secretly controlling a lot more than we realize, just because of his interest in appropriations. And yeah, generally I mean, keeping a low as, profile. As control, control seems a little strong, but I mean, I not control, he yeah. influences like a lot of decisions about the flow of money from certain government apparatus. So I guess it's even possible that in the future, as he gains more seniority, he could even become a kind of mini McConnell type in terms of his ability to, without having direct power, still being able to, like you said, cajole people. Yeah, and, you know, he's 
um, been consistently one of the highest ranking Latinos among the Democratic Party. So, like, he has, like, that clout with um, a very large community, at least people who are voted in, interested in voting. Right. So, um, he has a base, I think. Um, he's just, he doesn't focus on the front end or front facing element of that, I think, as much. So, you think it's possible that he's one of the rare people who has no interest in being president? It's impossible to say. Yeah, because I mean, it, from what I've seen here, I, I don't really see a lot of presidential aspirations here. No, um, much like Deb Holland, I think his interest and his personal vestment with Native American issues would make him an interesting Secretary of the Interior. Yeah. Um, where they have a lot of influence over the administration of tribal lands and like land issues and development. So maybe he could, maybe he could insert himself into that kind of position to, uh, cajole people a little further towards getting the money where he sees it should go. Yeah, I could see that. Um, so yeah, I, he's an interesting guy. He does, uh, in terms of where he gets his money though, so, mm -hmm. Democracy Engine, once again, uh, Blackstone Group, which, you know, investors, uh, is most notorious now for driving up the price of housing nationwide. Yeah. Um, Forbes Tate Partners, which is a lobbying firm, which I believe is a corporate lobbying firm. Um, so, his donor base is a little suspect, to say the least. Agreed. Um... I don't know why I want to defend him in this case, but I do think that it's pretty much impossible to run a campaign because his campaign for the last year was like six hundred thousand dollars. It looks like, yeah, and like you just you're gonna end up getting money from places that maybe you won't end up representing. But you know he's he's batted for both teams a little bit, so it's also hard to say. Yeah. That's true, and I guess it's possible. I mean, it's always possible that he um, is more of a moderate overall, um, who just happens to be pretty progressive on, say, Native American issues, mm -hmm. environment. Yeah, just because of personal experience. I think that's actually a really common thing with conservatives. Uh, I, I forget if it's. I don't. I don't remember, but some prominent Republican in the Senate. Uh, had a daughter who was lesbian and he was very firm on gay issues that like it should be legal like gay marriage should be legal I think that was uh, a was that Dick Cheney yeah that was Cheney yeah yeah no I mean that yeah, that was right. and apparently that caused a lot of tension with Bush when they were together in the White House at first it was fine but then uh, when Bush decided to just let's just you know play smear the queer for 2004 and just mm -hmm. really hit gay people in our campaign Cheney's like, I don't think that's appropriate. I think that's really some low shit. And then, you know, basically Rove and Bush told him to shut up. And that's when they stopped getting along. Fucking Carl Rove, man. Holy shit. shit. I need to stop thinking about him before I go on a tangent. Yeah, he's he's not worth it. <laughs> he's not supposed to be in this video. Jesus. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to see so... if there's anything else about... Illusion that's worth mentioning here. Hmm. And I can't think of anything else. Yeah, he's got he's got some strong upsides, but like also he's really just more talk on a lot of these issues where like it seems like he's good, but like you know his action just isn't there. Right. Um, and his money is a little questionable, but. I think generally, I feel like he's probably like a C plus. Yeah, I think he's about with Illusion Grisham. Um, they may not be cousins, but they can reside <laughs> together in the C tier. <laughs> um, and now we get to the representative of the first district. That would be Melanie Stansberry. She is the youngest of the people. Uh, no, she's not actually. The next person will be younger. Um, but she was born in 1979, so by the standards of politics, she is still pretty young. Um, 
She's from Albuquerque. She went to college in California where she studied human ecology and natural science. She then got an MS in developmental sociology with a minor in American Indian studies, but ended up not finishing her PhD at Cornell. So what happened most likely is that um, she was going for a PhD and decided to quit. And then they gave her a master's on her way out the door because that's usually how that works out. Yep. Uh, and then she yeah, was, you hit those like first two years. Yeah. Yeah. You get through, I think you've had to get about the generals and you can call it quits or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, and if it's MS, that means you probably didn't write a thesis. So yeah, that's probably what happened. Um, she was elected in 2021, uh, for her district. So actually, I guess that means she must've been elected in 2020, took office in 2021 and her district was once competitive. So this was the one competitive district, but in the recent years, it's been going more and more blue, so it's not really competitive anymore. Um, but Stansberry is a fairly progressive member of Congress. She is in favor of Medicare for All. She wants to ban assault weapons. She wants to make D.C. a state. She wants to cancel student loan debt. She wants federal marijuana legalization. And in general, all of her positions are either progressive or mainstream Democrat. I don't think she's really conservative on anything that I can find. Right. And she's really young. So, you know, we don't really have like a record to look at for her. Um, so then I guess you turn to her personal life where she went to Cornell, big name university and St. Mary's as well. Also a prestigious institution. Um, but she seemed to come away with that with the connections, but without like as much of a tinge of uh, protect established interests. Yes. No, I get that impression. Um, uh, we have a, we we have yet to see a lot from her, but what we have seen, at least in terms of a lot of talk, is hopeful. Yeah, I mean, she low key could possibly reply for the squad. Yeah, right? Um, I think she could, actually, based on her record, so, such as it is at this point. Um, um, hell, you as far can tell that she's from New Mexico because she has a minor in American Indian Studies, too. Yes, which I guess is probably very useful politically there because of uh, you know the strong constituency. I mean, 10% is pretty big. Yeah, it, um, and obviously, like, the voting amount is a lot lower, but, like, you know, that doesn't mean that the other 90% of the population isn't interested in other people's benefit or, like, their continued, like, growth or whatever you want to call it. Like, right, and, that things mean, are going well for them. I mean, New Mexico is one of the places where, I guess, uh, Bobby Kennedy would have loved to go talk because he used to like to talk about Native American issues. But all the time he'd be in, like, the white suburbs talking about it, and people would just be looking at him like, what the fuck are you talking about? Yeah, like, I, I don't know, like, do they have a fucking picket fence? Oh yeah, I mean, my God, they don't have a picket fence. We yeah, so, help yeah, so you'd be talking to, like, uh, you know, wealthy white people about the sufferings on uh, reservations, and they would just be like, uh, what? <laughs> Who are these people? These people live in this country? Yeah, it's like, wait, they're still around? Yeah. Uh, thought John Wayne poor... killed them all. <laughs> oh, poor Bobby. Yeah. Now, apparently, um, yeah, Bobby, I just listened to an audiobook about him. Apparently, he was one of those guys, he thought it was his moral imperative to bring up the Native Americans to, like, privilege white people and make them listen. So he did that quite a bit, like, almost at every campaign stop, he'd bring up Native Americans. Honestly, respect. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty... Uh, Bobby is actually Bold. cooler than I realized. I mean, he's... Uh, and also, I like to study, he's like, yeah, I know this isn't going to really win me anything politically, but I don't give a fuck. I gotta do it. Yeah. I, I kind of get that. Yeah, so, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, interesting. Important stuff. Um, and, you know, this this woman, I think she's, she's a white woman who kind of feels the same way. Especially growing up in a place where there is a lot of Native American poverty and alcoholism and just, like, exogenous factors that are causing misery. For sure. Um, so, yeah, I... Definitely on the issues. I mean, uh, you know, she's my kind of politician for sure in that way. Um, and also, remember when I talked about the sort of uh, massive jump in spending? 
on campaigns. Well, her her campaign is very cheap now for a house race, but it was still 1.7 million. So, you know, again, by today's standards, very cheap, but if this had been 10 or 15 years ago, it'd be like, God damn, she raised a lot of money. Um, yeah. So anyway, her biggest donors, uh, University of New Mexico, Emily's List, Democracy Engine, J Street, which is kind of like a more liberal alternative to APAC. So they're more for like a two-state solution, but they're mostly like an Israeli Jewish group. Uh, a bunch of law firms, Honeywell International, um, the International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Machinist and Aerospace Workers Union. So mostly... Yeah, that's part of her Albuquerque yeah. constituency because her, her district includes Albuquerque. And there is um, quite a bit of machining work in Albuquerque because of all of the metal extracts from the Southern Rockies. Right. So they have like a local local market for that. Yeah, so I mean her... Uh, so her... I guess her donor base seems to be pretty overwhelmingly left-leaning, except, of course, for Democracy Engine, which, you know, somewhat mysterious, this cloaked in mystery, newfangled uh, organization. Mm -hmm. um, so... Yeah, I, I generally say that she's high potential. Yeah. Uh, but that she's kind of an unknown quantity right now. I agree. In terms of what she's capable of accomplishing. Like, we don't know what, like, her charisma is like, uh, that kind of thing. All those, those uh, intangibles that go to making a successful politician in this country. Right, because, I mean, I know with a couple of people here, they definitely, even if their stances are a little more progressive, they do seem like the kind who believe in, like, pander dues and, uh, you know, making sure they have permission and all that. And I don't really have a yeah, feel for... In the patron. Which with with her, I don't really have a feel for whether she's in that group or not. So I don't really know. Yeah, and it it leaves a somewhat bad taste in my mouth that um, she's a bit more cosmopolitan, but it doesn't have to be a bad thing. But uh, it often is correlated with that kind of behavior. So. Yeah, which, I mean, cause the thing is, like, I guess I'd have to know more about the circumstances. Uh, cause my guess is if she quit the PhD and left early, she probably just figured out that maybe academia is not for her. So she mm -hmm. left and then she had to figure out what to do with her life after that and then kind of worked away in the politics. Cause, I mean, you wouldn't, I don't think that'd be the plan if you were trying to, uh, like, if you plan to be a politician all along, I don't think you would go to a PhD program and leave midway through. Right. So, I mean, I don't think her, yeah, I don't think with her that was the plan. At least it doesn't, that's not the impression I get. So. Yeah, she's, uh, she's definitely interesting. Um, her advocacy is in, is pretty narrowly placed, but I think in good spots. So hopefully she can accomplish some like actual positive stuff. Yeah. And I mean, um, I think some of the issues that she's for seem a little more national, but, uh, you know, I'm always all for having more advocates for things like Medicare for all and getting rid of student loan debt and things like that. So, yeah. And, and I mean, she seems big on, um, like water conservation. Yeah. And big and into unions. Like, yeah. Right. And so it, it seems like she's like pro union and also pro these industries that like conserve things. So those kind of go hand in hand, uh, making sure that the workers are properly provided for so that they can do the best in resource management of important things like fucking water, which right. in New Mexico, kind of a big deal, especially when there's a burgeoning agricultural sector and, you know, also a growing population in a state that is mostly arid. Yes. Uh, so that water has to come from somewhere and it's going to have to be managed pretty tightly. Mm -hmm. um, so, so taking care of the employees involved in work like that, uh, it's smart, yeah. smart thinking. And also the uh, other, uh, Fernandez is also big on water management too. Yeah, I saw that. Um, do you want to move on to her or um, uh, Gabe? 
We can uh, do Vasquez Gabe first. Vasquez first. But, uh, how do we want to rate Melanie Stansberry? She's hard to rank because of her short tenure in office. Yeah. Um, what, are, what are you feeling? An A or a B. But again, it's so, yeah, it is a little too early to really know what will happen with her. So I, I'm willing to go with a, a B. Um, yeah. Like a B, basically. Yeah, so I mean, it's still a little early to tell, and it's hard to really get a feel for if she'll stick with the principles or how sincere she is or anything like that, just because she just does not have a very high profile. Um, mm -hmm. And next up, we have uh, the youngest of the New Mexico politicians, Gabe Vazquez, who is, I think, 39, because he was born in 1984. He was born in El Paso, Texas, raised in Mexico, but then came to New Mexico for college. Got a B.A. in English and Journalism from New Mexico State. Uh, he was the business editor for the Las Cruces Bulletin. And then he was the executive director of the Las Cruces Hispanic Chamber of Commerce from 2013 to 15. And joined the Heinrich campaign as a field representative. And I guess that must have been what got him into politics. So he went into mm -hmm. advocacy. So first focus, which is like a D.C. firm. Uh, for about two years, 2016 to 18. Then he was a community relations officer for the New Mexico chapter of the Wilderness Society, 2019 to 21. And then he was the deputy director of Western Conservation Foundation. So he is, I guess what you might call a cosmopolitan resume patter, because he's done a lot of positions. A lot of them have been DC based and most of them have not lasted very long. A lot of them though, I think have a lot in common. They're all very front facing all of them are interested in public perception, like communications director, uh, newspaper, uh, communications director for an advocacy organization. All that stuff is, he understands, obviously, at least a little bit, public relations. Yeah. Um, which I would say pretty important for a politician. <laughs> yeah, I would say it's a good skill set, that's for sure. Um, yeah, it's definitely a good resume for, like, uh, a very junior um, rep in the House. And also, it's very apparent that he cares about land use. Because a couple of the, the things he did leading up to his congressional run um, involved land use. Right. I, yeah. So yeah, he does have that issue that he'll be able to talk about on a you know at least a semi-expert basis, right? Especially because when he was being raised in Ciudad Juarez, like that's a place that is also desert, and they've had issues with land use um, because of like over over grazing and stuff like that, which are similar problems to New Mexico. So I good guess that he has personal experience with the consequences of misuse of land and hence is an advocate right that makes sense and uh, yeah you're right i mean there's a very consistent pattern at play of the places he's lived and the jobs he's held so i mean that makes me more inclined to think that there's some genuineness yeah agreed and that um he has a strategy uh, for how he how he conducts politics. Like he has a consistent approach. Yeah. Yeah, and um, he barely got elected though. So in 2022, um, he ran in this district, and apparently, second district. So the first district leaned blue, but was competitive. It's now just becoming straight up blue. Second district was red, and now it's becoming more competitive, but trending blue. And Gabe Vasquez is really the first person to win in a while. And mm -hmm. um, so he won by 1,300 votes in 2022. Yeah, so the person he was running against is a little different. She She's Native American, but from the Southeast. And from my understanding, she played up her credentials as Native American. Um, and it worked in during the Trump presidency. Ah, uh, so he was facing an incumbent who had a certain like tribal reputation, despite 
basically just being raised as a white woman. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, basically what Elizabeth Warren wishes that she could do. Right. Yeah. When, um, um, yeah. So it, it makes sense that it was close, uh, especially given the demographics locally. Yeah, so it, he eked out a win and, um, I guess one of his only, I guess what you could call, um, you want to call it a scandal? I mean, I feel like it's a little stupid to call it a scandal since it's Twitter, but, um, he had a Twitter scandal where he, lit, uh, made some controversial tweets attacking the oil and gas industry, which, you know, cool. And, uh, he also rationalized rioting in the summer of 2020. He compared the Trump administration to the KKK. Um, I mean, I feel like that's all pretty mild for Twitter. I don't know. Yeah, it's mild for Twitter, but I think we mentioned it earlier. Like, on a larger scale, this stuff gets played up more. There's more money involved to amplify these kinds of things. And um, conservatives really don't like being compared to the Ku Klux Klan, despite the fact that they all vote for them. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of them think they're not voting for them, though. Well, uh, uh, sorry, I had that in reverse. I, I misspoke. I meant, like, that the KKK votes for them. Right, yeah. Um, and so it's like... It, the plausible deniability argument kind of falls apart. That's a different... Yeah, I mean, that being said, I mean, if you think about it, like, any any negative group in the country will vote for one of the two major parties, pretty much. That's um, true. I mean, like, it definitely goes at odds with the uh, the Democrats of the party of the KKK thing, that which is just, like, completely ignoring political right, alignment, historical right. yeah, argument, I mean, which always makes me want to blow my brains out. Because it's almost as if parties can change what they stand for and their constituencies and demographics and everything else over time, uh, which is crazy. Yeah. But yeah, you know, change happens sometimes. Wow, especially when there are yeah. things like World War II and the Industrial Revolution and other things, and the end of slavery. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah, sometimes the obvious needs to be restated because it's just painful how often it gets challenged who's that guy's dinesh d'souza who always says the democrats are the racist party and here are my examples none of which is within the last hundred years yeah like wasn't he the former director of the fcc he might be i, I know uh i read a book by laura ingram where she was trying to take credit for the trump revolution and because she was so uh desperate for clout she would mention in college me and dinesh dated and she mentions that about ten times. God. My my ex boyfriend, Dinesh D'Souza. <laughs> so embarrassing. Because at this point, like they're both fifty or so, so it's been thirty years be you know, since they were in college. But yet she won't. Either maybe she's still got the candle lit for him. I don't know. But uh, <laughs> yeah, right, like, But I think it's just a clout thing. I don't know. Because I, I, I think it's more clout than romantic. But I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It is a bit odd to mention it that many times, though. Did you know I once dated Dinesh D'Souza? Have I brought that up this conversation? Well, yeah, famous uh, felon who can't vote because yeah. he was involved in election fraud. Well, to be fair, the Billionaires at the Barricades book came out, I think, about a year before that scandal. So, Ugh. so now I guess you'd probably say, um, did I ever mention that I I've once dated someone who was famous? I'm not gonna name him. Yeah, it's it's just lazy, lazy. Yeah. Uh, so, with uh, Gabe, let's see, his big voters here, Gabe Vasquez, uh, he got money from the Diamond A Ranch LLC, which is an Angus ranch based out of Arizona. Um, he got money from Guadalupe Maintenance Company, which is a janitorial and building maintenance service. The Massachusetts General Hospital, New Mexico State University, which is the only thing that he shares in common with anyone else we've talked about. Yeah. And the Anthropocene Institute, which is an environmental regulation and climate change advocacy group, which I assume is more national. Uh, so he definitely has a very different donor base than anybody we looked at. Well, despite the fact that he 
seems to care about land use, he receives money from groups that, like, it, it might at first pass look like their opinion on land use is that it is for exploitation and not for preservation. So that just seems a bit conflicting at first pass. Uh, I would also point out that he did also get his BA at New Mexico State, where um, a couple of other folks in our list have gone to school. So, yeah, he. Uh, so I think he might be the first person who got money from the school he actually went to. I could be wrong about that, though. Um, There's probably some dollars in there for the other people. Yeah, because I, I usually only look at top five or ten, because once you get beyond that, the sums are so small that I don't really care. Right, and, well, I can't imagine the university is giving that much, so. Yeah, most of the top donors in New Mexico are only in the 30 to 40 grand range anyway. Mm-hmm. Well, sometimes for the bigger ones, it'll be a 70 or 80, but it's not like a lot of the other states we've looked at where the donation amounts are pretty substantial. Yeah, right, like we're Montana where you just have senators for sale. Yeah, yeah, the uh, legacy of who was that guy from the healthcare debate who was number one in donations and was two to one over the next senator, uh, Bacchus, that fucking asshole. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, great, great guy. Just put him in charge of the whole thing. Let's do it. Yeah, and that's what Obama did. Um, exactly. Whether it was an experience or wanting his uh, health care reform to fail, I don't know. Um. Is, you know, it'll be interesting to read um, histories in the future of American political illegitimacy. I know there'll be a thing. Um, yeah. But I'll be curious in my old age to see what they look like. Yeah, they probably won't be a pleasant read. It'll probably be a pretty scathing account of uh, our generation and the generations before us. Mm-hmm. Well, and, you know, I think in the, the generations that have come after uh, Gen X, like, it's been a pretty major uphill struggle. Yeah. Like, there are, uh, you know, I guess in economics, you call them, like, barriers to entry, and those have only gotten larger. Whether it's copyright law or just general financial disincentives to participation in the political sphere. Yeah, um, it's we're in the middle of a pretty major crisis, um, and it has many, many fronts. It seems like more fronts are always opening up; very few are closing. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of them have narrowed down to like a single talking point, but they're still there. They're still festering. Yeah, because I mean, I felt like we had resolved the gay rights thing and also abortion, but uh, yeah, there's some people who want to reopen those wounds, and yeah. Yeah, it's, um, you know, when, when when we talk about a slower state like this, I think it is important to bring up, like, the broader conflicts. Right. To contextualize, like, why this conversation is important. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, so uh, how do you... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, with uh, Vasquez... I feel like he's another one. He's basically an unknown quantity at this point. I mean, is, is he a consistent advocate advocate for uh, land management, or is he a resume patter and a careerist? Because at this point, I have no idea. Right. No, we we just spent the last ten minutes spinning a narrative or two narratives about him, and we don't really have enough evidence to lean either way because we haven't seen enough action because. He's only been in office for just a spot, and um, yeah, his, his rhetoric is fine, I, and I mean fine in the very uh, positivistic sense. Like, it's good stuff. Like, he's obviously somebody who knows how to do forward-facing um, communication, but you know, he also takes money from people who don't agree with what he has to say. So things kind of remain to be seen. Uh, given his background, I'm willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. Well, I guess it, it's one of those things we probably have to revisit in about five years and see what happened. 
Mm. Um, it's interesting. This state has a whole new crop in the representatives. Like, it's not a lot of long-seated people. Yeah, because, I mean, the two senators were in the House for a while, so I guess they're kind of known. But uh, the new reps are all almost brand new. Yeah. Um, and so, for right now, I, I'm content to put Vasquez in C, just because he is... He could go either way pretty dramatically. Agreed. I'm I'm very comfortable with that. I was going to go C or B, depending on how much you trust him. Uh, I don't trust him as much as Stansberry. Yeah. Um, so our final representative is po- probably the most active of the three, I would say, in terms of uh, getting out and getting headlines and uh, really being involved. And that would be Teresa Leger Fernandez. She's also the oldest of the representatives. She was born in 1959. So um, her mom was a teacher. Her dad was actually a state senator. And she came from Las Vegas. So her dad would have been in... Or actually, I guess her dad was a New Mexico state senator. But for whatever reason, she was raised in Las Vegas. Um, later on, after she grew up, she went to Yale and then to Stanford, where she got her... Uh, law degree, and her specialty as a lawyer is actually tribal advocacy. So when she came back to New Mexico, she really set up there, and she's always had a lot of ties to D.C. And so during the Clinton administration, she was a White House fellow, which there aren't that many of those. And later on, during the Obama presidency, she was on the Advisory Council on Historical Preservation. So she's someone who's clearly been well-connected for a number of years. Uh, but her main job was always more in the private sector. She has a law firm called Legger Law and Strategy, LLC, based out of Santa Fe. And she focuses on community development, tribal advocacy, civil rights, and social justice. And she also is an advocate for local issues as well. So in Santa Fe, she helped get through a ranked choice voting system in the city elections. And but not to- yeah, not just the city, just the like it, it applies to judges as well. Oh, that's pretty cool. Okay, I didn't realize it was that so it, widespread. It's, it's the entire municipality. Nice, okay. A little better than I thought. Um, so, uh, yeah, when Tom Udall retired, uh, Ben Ray Lusion uh, decided to leave his seat as a rep in the 3rd District, so she decided to run for it. And it, I feel like she just... Didn't ever think she was running for office, but once that opening came up, she decided to go for it. I don't know if she was asked to go for it or what. I assume somebody tapped her because she was a well-known, prominent local person. And in the primary, she took on six opponents, including the most powerful of them was former CIA agent Valerie Plame, who was famous for uh, her role in the Bush years when uh, someone in the the White House, I believe it was Scooter Libby, outed her and she almost got killed while on assignment abroad. so I missed that, my god. Yes, she was running against a minor celebrity here and still beat her and five other people. Fortunately, the uh, Bush administration connections, for her sake, probably yeah. left a bad taste in well, people's I mean, mouth. Well, Valerie Plame was more a victim of the Bush administration. Ah, uh, being outed, yeah. Yeah, and then based, uh, by extension, an opponent of it. Um, uh, okay. But as for... Uh, Fernandez, she also was endorsed by the Working Families Party during this race, and she got Elizabeth Warren and AOC to endorse her as well. Uh, She is divorced with three sons, and she is known for advocating a New Mexico Green New Deal, for pushing for Medicare for All, and for getting rid of fracking and transitioning to green energy. She also wants to ban semi-automatics. Her biggest donors are J Street, which is the thing we talked about earlier. It's kind of like the more lefty version of IPAC. She is also backed by Democracy Engine, a bunch of law firms, University of New Mexico. Um, One thing that's interesting is that on her official page, rather than having the access to quality health care, which is the go-to weasel word for Democrats who don't want to say that they're for Medicare for all or against it, she says people should have a right to quality health care. And I don't know if that is significant or not, but I think there might be something to that. Yeah, it's hard to tell uh, because people are more willing to push the envelope on language than action. Right. Um, but, you know, it, on, on paper, it is 
very progressive. Yeah, so and that's her her record somewhat speaks for itself. Um like all of her work prior to this recent election um her her work in advocacy for like disempowered people has been pretty impressive. Yeah. You know, and she's working through the system, you know, she's not trying to like subvert anything and be super radical, but you know, what she is doing is uh like like tribal advocacy is very difficult work. There are a lot of legal hurdles and a lot of community hurdles because like a lot of the tribal advocacy is going to require consent from the tribes. And that's not very easy a lot of the time. Right. Because there's a lot of, um, what do you call it? Like disillusion yeah. with even interacting with the system. So acting as any kind of tribal advocate is, is challenging and wor uh, work that requires you to not only be a spokesperson, but to be like a coalition builder. For sure. Um, so like much like, uh, Mr. Vasquez, um, I'm willing to give her benefit of the doubt because like her and, and she's older, so she has a longer, uh, rep, but she has a lot of good work under her belt. Yeah. And with her resume too, I mean, I don't think anybody could say that she's unqualified for the office that she holds or question her resume, really. Agreed. I mean, if you're if you're doing tribal advocacy in a way, you're basically already doing the job that she's doing now. Yeah, I mean, that and she also has proven effective even as a private citizen getting ranked choice voting uh, in her municipality. So, I mean, yeah, she, uh, you know, she came in as a pretty impressive candidate, I'd say. Agreed. Um, I think she has a pretty high ceiling. Um, I Who knows how long she wants to serve. She's already in her 60s, but that's never stopped anybody. Yeah, and I mean, I imagine, uh, I just don't, I don't get the impression that she's quite as uh, weather-beaten as you know, a lot of the other politicians who are you know, clearly just hanging on by a thread. <laughs> Feinstein. Yeah. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, and I guess that's the thing is, you know, age can be somewhat relative because, I mean, there's a difference. I mean, Bernie's technically older than Biden, but if you interview each one, you could be forgiven for coming with the impression that Bernie's actually a lot younger. Yeah. Um, so in terms <laughs> of her other stances, Fernandez is also pro-immigration, which, um, the other candidates don't really stress much on immigration. It seems like that might be something they try to ignore a little bit. Um, but she's definitely on the pro-immigrant side, and she makes no bones about that. Um, she focuses very heavily on water management and fighting wildfires, which, again, as we discussed, you know, makes a lot of sense. And she's also a big advocate of rural broadband. So she wants to have, uh, you know, reliable high-speed internet even in rural areas. Uh, now, the one thing, uh, one thing also that I liked about her language on the website is that she calls Social Security an earned benefit, which is technically what it is, rather than a, quote, entitlement. Entitlement was a Republican word invented in the 80s. Right. She's not willing to capitulate on language to Republican framing. Yeah, and I mean, that might seem like a small thing, but given how few Democrats actually do it, it's actually the first time I've seen anybody use the language earned benefit and then just use it and not explain it more. Because usually somebody would explain it like, here's why it matters, but she's just like, no, it's an earned benefit, and we're moving on. So I don't know whether it means she's stronger on it, or that it is just a way to show her progressivism through language without having to back it up. Uh, but I suspect she knows exactly why she called it that. Yeah, given given her long-time work in advocacy, I have a feeling that she understands legalistic language. Yeah, she is a lawyer, after all, so... She, uh... um, yeah, so she understands like the applications of those language in terms of what you get as somebody who's trying to interface with benefits because she's an advocate. So she sees what people on the front end get and 
um, understands why certain language is important. Yes. And uh, the one thing I found on her site that I was a little uh, miffed by, given how I liked her statements and everything else, is that when it came to her statement on labor, she was very vague and noncommittal. So she not only didn't talk about any policies, but didn't really say anything at all. So it's just like, yeah, you know, work is important and jobs are important too. So it's just like the most meaningless statement imaginable. That's a little disappointing, but it it seems like she's a little more issue focused. Um, and this just is not one of the issues that she's spent a lot of time on. Uh, but it, you know, she could she could brush that up. Who knows? Yeah, might branch out at the national stage now. Well, like given given her proclivity towards progressive positions, you know, it would only take like a couple people talking to her to show her that this is also an important facet of progressive policy. Yeah, I could see her becoming someone. I, I bet she would be a reliable vote on a union vote. I, I mean, I don't think she'd be like a co-sponsor, but I bet she'd be a vote. Agreed. So. Um, personally, I'm a huge fan of her, her ad, like her district has a ton of native reservations in it. Um, just south of Albuquerque, there is a swath of reservations, uh, most prominently the Zuni. Um, and all those reservations are within her constituency, although uh, technically not, but technically kind of, right. it's a bit of a mess. Uh, but her her land land use and um, just her general attitude towards it is actually very very representative of an often underappreciated element of this third district's constituency, and so in that sense, I think she's excellent because she actually represents the group of people who elected her. Yeah. Um, no, I definitely can see that with her. I mean, she definitely seems like she fits this district really well. Because that we're talking about the southern part of New Mexico, right? I think so, so yeah. A huge chunk of it is military bases. Um, but then another huge chunk of it is um, native land. Yeah, so I think she um, fits the bill pretty well for this district. Um, in terms of like, I was just thinking about potential to really accomplish something in the near future. I think that she has the most potential of anybody on the list in the near future. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. the younger candidates like Morales and um, Stansberry and Vasquez in the grand scheme of things because of their youth have the potential to do more going forward, but I think in, that, say, the next 10 years, Fernandez is most likely to really make a splash. I guess depends on what you mean by make a splash. I think... Like pass uh, a major bill or um, something of that nature. Yeah, in that sense, completely agreed. She could be, she could be a critical part of passing protections for the lands in these areas, which... It's worth pointing out, Trump, like, shrank a bunch of these protected areas. And Biden, like, I want to say within the first 20 days, like, restored them to their previous borders. Because Trump had shrank them for increased drilling and prospecting. Um, so that kind of thing, like, you know, like more firmly enshrining protections for some of this land, I think that she would probably work with that. And the current Secretary of the Interior, Holland, who is also former New Mexico Senator or and House Rep, I want to say, um, big advocate for that, especially in the region. Right. So uh, as far as like very short term within the Biden presidency, I could see something like that happening. And I imagine that she's probably also a green energy energy advocate. 
So maybe she could be involved with some of that. But she seems more like, yeah, HUD kind of stuff. Yeah, I could see that. And I feel like she's someone with the requisite experience to, if she were, say, Secretary of the Interior or in some other capacity, that she actually could help Native Americans in a pretty substantial way. Yeah, no, not to mention that, you know, she went to uh, Yale and Stanford, so she has connections. She probably and... does. Although I guess she probably wasn't planning on using those connections in D.C. because it seems like she was fairly content in Santa Fe until yeah. that seat became open. So some of her You're... connect, I'm sure she was able to reconnect with all those people once she arrived in D.C., though. Yeah, you're going to get that. I mean, she went to Stanford Law School, like. That, that'll have some connections in D.C. that could be utilized. For sure. No, I mean, um, so... Not to mention that she worked with both the Clinton and Obama administrations, so... Yeah, so I guess she always saw herself as more like a, you know, senior fundraiser and organizer on the ground for the party. Uh, so she does have... I imagine in local elections, too, she's going to be damn unbeatable just because she knows all the people who run everything in Santa Fe and in her district. Yeah, how did... Let's see, she won by a 17-point margin. And I think that's supposed to be, in theory, a competitive district, so... Well, let's look at the historical election data. <laughs> I see the Libertarian in previous elections taking 10%, so... <laughs> Interesting. Um... Yeah, I, I definitely agree with your uh, with your analysis that she can make a splash because she has the connections, she has the competency, um, and she has like the specific interests that I think she wants to see done um, that she would like uh, agitate for. Yeah, and the other thing too is I think she might be Latina, and given right now that a lot of the Democratic Party's strategy is all about balancing tickets you know, ethnically and gender-wise, mm -hmm. um, I could see somebody trying to take her as a VP at some point just because she seems like she has a pretty good resume, she's not controversial, and she seems pretty genuine. So, I mean, I don't know what she's like as a speaker, but I imagine she's probably reasonably likable. So, I would not be surprised if she ended up on at least being considered as a VP for somebody. I think that's a, yeah, you have a good eye for that. Um, my personal thought is that maybe she would need to rise a little bit higher to get that kind of consideration. But I also don't think that that is out of the realm of possibility. Yeah, I mean, um, I guess if she has like one major issue to advocate something, it blows up on the news, goes viral. In that, in that case, it raises her profile enough that then she's really in that the running for that. I, yeah, I think I think she would be a good VP candidate, just based on this limited information I have about her. Um, but you know, it's also like the Democrats are in a spot where they're in a desert of talent. So yeah, maybe they are willing to look lower, like to a junior rep in the House. Yeah, because I imagine, like, if, say, there was a big, if there was some sort of yearning among youthful voters for someone from the squad, then a candidate might choose someone who is not in the squad partly because of age and maybe a couple other differences, but someone who's sort of compatible with the squad. So I feel like in that, if there was that yearning for whatever reason, uh, then Fernandez could also fit that bill as kind of a, you know, I'll give you kind of what you want but not really solution. Right. And, and somebody who, like, knows the system and knows how to navigate it. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, could see, I could see a number of scenarios where she makes sense as a ticket balancer or as a cabinet member. Um, yeah. That being said, I don't, yeah, I, don't get that, like, I don't get that sense of, like, overweening ambition, though. So I don't think she's – I don't think she'll challenge for a Senate seat necessarily unless uh, somebody retires. Or I don't think she'll put herself in a primary for president. No, it, she doesn't strike me as the type. Not like a, a beautiful person like Cory Booker. 
Yeah. Yeah, Cory Booker, uh, number one in crying in the whole U.S. Senate. <laughs> the best crier since John Yo, Boehner. <laughs> Boehner, oh, man. Well, the Boehner was in the House. So I guess maybe Booker's the king of the Senate crying, so. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Um, he needs a new challenger, clearly. Yeah. He's not that good. Uh, but I feel like, uh, would you think Biden is going to keep Kamal on the ticket, or do you think he's in a sacker for somebody else? I feel like the political inertia demands that he keeps her on the ticket. But she sucks, and I feel like everybody has come to acknowledge that, except for maybe like 15% of Democratic voters. Yeah, and I feel like, too, the thing is, like most Democrats weren't exactly thrilled when he announced he's going to run for re-election, so he needs to do something to gin up some excitement. And I right. feel like and getting rid of Kamala is the easiest possible solution. I wasn't thrilled when I heard Bernie wasn't going to run and then he's just going to endorse Biden. And I'm like, okay, I respect it because, like, yeah, you're old. You had a heart attack on the last campaign. Like, yeah. Fine. I mean, like, that being gotta, said, even, with, at some point, but even like, with Bernie's, yeah. hell, even with Bernie's heart attack, I still feel like he's got more in the tank than Biden, which Agreed. is not saying he's Agreed. got that much in the tank, but still, I mean, comparatively, uh, he can still he can still ignite a campaign trail. Yeah, he can still give a speech that you can follow. <laughs> so No, because like when you're exactly like when you're listening to Biden and Trump have a debate, like my god, dude. Like it's It's gonna be even worse. If, if assuming both of them are nominated, it's going to be even shittier than last time. I mean it's just like for the Republicans, like it's gotta be Trump because DeSantis has no charisma. Well, also, he just is a fucking idiot when it comes to choosing issues. I mean, he uh, he's talking about he only does culture war stuff. And the thing is, so for people who are perpetual online, that sounds great, and they get all excited about gas stoves or trans athletes or whatever. But even your average normie Republican gives no fucks about such things. Right? No, they want to hear they want to hear economics. Yes, after hearing multiple culture war issue, culture war issue, culture war issue, banned books. It's like, okay, so what are you going to do if you're president? Because clearly it's got to be more important than this. And then he yeah, will answer. If, if I was a Republican, I would be pretty fucking frustrated. Yeah, I saw something by uh, that guy who got, one of the guys who got arrested for January 6th, the, the streamer Baked Alaska. Um, and he basically, That's he was... Tough. Stupid, holy crap. Yeah, basically he was saying, I can't believe I went to jail for this guy. He was talking about Trump being a clown and selling NFTs and all that. Then he said, well, I don't know. I might vote for him again, though, if he runs, just because of the alternative. <laughs> so, it's just kind of like he spoke out of both sides of his mouth. Like, well, you know, I hate him, but at the same time, I mean, if my continued career depends on supporting him, eh, maybe I will. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's not just the Democrats, it's the Republicans who are, they're, they're both both parties are in a complete desert of political talent. No, I mean, the benches are empty, and then uh, the recruitment system's falling apart. Um, yeah. No, if it, if it was the NBA, you'd be pulling guys from, like, the MVP of the league in China to come play. Yeah, or uh, like the G League would already be emptied out. You'd be just going recruiting straight from like D two schools. <laughs> like, all yeah, right, get a uh, get Duncan Robinson. Yeah, Duncan Robinson by this point would be the MVP of the league. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, averaging yeah, averaging like thirty eight points a game. Yeah, twenty percent shooting. Yeah, except now he'll be averaging thirty eight on sixty percent from three because nobody can play defense <laughs> anymore. Uh, but yeah, it's um. It's crazy how untalented this group is, and even look at somebody like, even their age now, uh, somebody like Bill Clinton, even with all his health issues and age and everything else, if if he somehow could run, he'd probably destroy right now. And he barely won his elections back in the day. Right. And once... Once Trump, and I think it goes a little bit back to, like, elections in California, but, like, once Trump knocked the door open for any business person to just run for office, um, I think the floodgates are going to open in the coming decades. Yeah, um, 
I mean, I enjoyed the John Delaney campaign quite a bit. <laughs> uh, but that was more just like a midlife crisis. And I think it was just an excuse to stay in Iowa and hook up with random local women. Because I'm pretty sure he was hooking up with a lot of women in Iowa. Well, those poor women. Well, apparently they were into it. You know, like They were also age-appropriate, which is, uh, I guess, good. So right. most most women who were flirting with him on Instagram with his workout photos, most of them were probably at least in their forties, mostly like fifties, so about his age, and you know. Oh, good for him! He passed the fucking bare minimum bar. Yes, I mean at least when he spent like fifty million of his own dollars to do this campaign, at least the women he had sex with, or I assume he had sex with, uh, at least they were age appropriate and they seemed to be interested in him. So that's cool. At least for the time being. I think Michael Bloomberg proved that you can't outright just buy an election. No, when he tried to do that, actually, for the moment, I was like, you know, this. there's a possibility if he actually pulls this off, he would literally be worse than Trump. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, because, because of his methodology of running a campaign... Yeah, so, there's, there's, the sheer cynicism of that would have been enough to invalidate the entire premise of our political system. Mm-hmm. Even, even if you don't care about, like, nepotism, like uh, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, or the Bushes, or the Clintons, even if you ignore that, like, if you can just buy it, then we're obviously in trouble. Yeah, at that point, America even has become a joke. I mean, even like the first triumvirate of the Roman and the Roman uh, late Republic, I mean, even they didn't just straight out buy the Republic. I mean, they had enough financial power to get anybody elected, but they actually had to combine forces among a few guys. And then well, they actually yeah, had to advocate I mean, things people wanted to get votes. I mean, it's not, they couldn't even do what Bloomberg was trying to do. Yeah, like the moment that makes that obvious, because it's like, you know, ex post facto, we have plenty of information but like you look at like when when caesar was elected consul in 62 or yeah 61 um It'd be like in, uh, for 59 so he got elected in 60 or, or 59 okay yeah. right right because okay when he introduces the land reform bill people are shocked when crassus and pompey support it and that, like, basically shuts down the debate because your first reigning consuls are, like, opposed to each other, but they're both in favor of this land reform bill. So let's go. Yeah, I mean, because up to that point, the idea is, well, we'll play Crassus against Pompey, and then... Mm -hmm, we'll play the money yeah. against the prestige. And actually, but by, I think by the time he came back, Pompey actually had more money than Crassus. Oh, uh, after his campaigns in the East. Yes, I mean, like, there were one and two in terms of wealth between them, and they were just so massively ahead of everybody else when they combined their resources, and they could just fund any person they wanted. So that's how they got a lot of their allies. And then Pompey's veterans could also vote and put you over the top if you became his friend. Um, right, especially if you have, um, uh, what's his name, the street gang leader. Uh well, their street gang leader was Clodius originally, and then the Senate got Claudius, Milo. Claudius. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Especially if you have Claudius riling up people, former veterans with daggers inside the pomerium. Yeah. Nah, that was a that was a crazy period. But even so, I mean, I feel like Bloomberg was still somehow worse than the Triumvirs. And I guess to be fair to, uh, the people the Triumvirs did this to were probably somehow even worse. Yeah. The consistent i mean they were just willing to murder people like yes I, I, you want to do some uh land reform how's my dagger feel you'll find yeah, out like sorry tiberius yeah it's like if you, if you disturb the peace of our order then you'll die for it we believe yeah, in free um, speech and free debate but also if you do certain things i'll kill you your your videos on the 90s uh, BC, especially, were like the last gasp of reform before it just became inevitable that conflict was going to have to happen for this to happen. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, things by that point had really gone off the rails, and uh, once the social war happens, I mean, at that point, Rome proved 
we will not do any reforms that are not literally foisted upon us. And the mm -hmm. only reason we agreed to do the reasonable thing is because we couldn't win militarily. So we decided, yeah, we'll just uh, we'll be fair to our allies for a change because otherwise we'll be stuck fighting them for years on end. So yeah, trying to trying to have Marian style legions face each other in combat. Um, well, you know, the next four centuries proved that that wasn't very effective either. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, for uh, Fernandez, how do you want to rate her? Because I'm thinking she should probably be in the A tier for now. But yeah, I'm I'm definitely willing to go with A. Um, I'm excited, and I definitely agree with your idea that, given her credentials, she could make a splash. Yeah, I think she has potential. And again, the other thing is, I guess. I don't. I certainly don't know too much about the charisma of a lot of the people here, mm -hmm. um, but I know New Mexico does not have a very high standard for charisma because I mean Bill Richardson is kind of like the legend of New Mexico, and right. he was pretty damn bland. No, but he knew how to play inside baseball. Yeah, I mean he was a very skilled politician, but he was also not super interesting. Right. So New Mexico has a different environment for that. Yeah, I'm I'm totally willing to give Fernandez an A. Yeah, I mean, and again, this I guess partly is based on potential and possibility. So this has been a different list because of the the relative newness of all of their uh, people in office right now, except for mm -hmm. the two senators who are really the only truly uh, experienced people. I guess the governor and the two senators, but everybody else is brand new, really. Um, so yeah, it leaves it leaves you with a pretty interesting landscape here, and um, a lot of the issues are the same, and a lot of them are actually very much tied to state interests, which is different from I think what you've looked at before on this series. Yeah, um, and so I think generally, like the ratings will be higher because they are actually tied to constituent interests, and uh, the unproven nature versus the um, numbers that we've seen from the donors. Um, you know, that'll be played out in real time. Right. But with what we've got to work with right now, yeah. Like, a lot of these um, these reps look really, really good. Yeah, I mean, uh, New Mexico is not the problem overall. It's... Yeah, it, it, the state government isn't the problem. There are definitely yeah. there are definitely issues, but overall, I I'd be I'd be spending my energy elsewhere. Like, man, the Appalachian states need a good hard look. Yeah, um, Tennessee and Kentucky. I mean, oh yeah, Kentucky, but and then, uh, West Virginia. <laughs> West Virginia. Look at Mansion. Um, uh, Jim Justice. <laughs> Yeah, we got you got some rough, uh, some rough people, as far as politicians go. There. Oh yeah, no, I mean, um, West Virginia would be a fun one, but that would be one where I need to stock up on a little bit of liquor before we do that one. <laughs> but um, it would only be uh, regionally appropriate. Yeah, I have to figure out what the you know West Virginia drink of choice is. I don't actually know. But also, oh, it's part of the research. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, part of the research. That's one way to look at it. Um, <laughs> so yeah, anyway, uh, well, thank you, Theofano, for joining me for this. This was an interesting look into New Mexico, which is, I'd say, a, not, I, I wouldn't quite say boring state, but certainly not uh, dramatic. How about that? Just sort of an undramatic state that goes about its business. People seem to be relatively well behaved compared to a lot of the rest of the country, at least in politics. Yeah, and, I would call it not typical compared to a lot of other states. Yeah, more relaxed. They they, they do their own thing. Um, they they follow an older pattern here uh, that we don't really see as much anymore. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting place for sure. Um, but, um, yeah, so I think we can just about call it now, unless you have any concluding remarks. 
I think I already gave them. So All right. it's been a great conversation. Uh, I know we had a lot of asides. Uh, That's okay. Especially sure? on a spot like this, it's fun to be tangential. So it was a it was a good conversation, and there's a lot of information here that could be looked at a little deeper. Yeah, no, there's definitely more here to investigate if someone is so minded. All right. Well, in that case, uh, I will see you all later on. I'm not sure when we'll get around to doing another one of these, but um, I'm sure it will be in the future, obviously. So. All right, well, that being said, good night and good luck, everybody, and um, see you around.